Well, good morning, good morning. It's Derek Watson, the Angry Dentist here. Those of you who are particularly astute may have noticed something slightly different about this video. And that is, I'm not at the paper shop. I've had to turn round. There is something blocking access to the paper shop. And it's a bloody great lorry with a bucket, like a crane on the back with a big bucket on it and it's picking something up off the road. Goodness knows what. So, I mean, you know, I drive down narrow lanes on the way to work and so of course, you know, you get used to perhaps getting stuck behind a combine harvester or uh, behind a bus that meets a, a lorry coming the other way and the two of them have to sort of jiggle about to get past each other. That's quite normal. But a Crane lorry picking up, craning stuff out of the road. I mean, I, there's 20 cars in the queue. What this idiot thought he was doing, just stopping in the middle of a country road and craning stuff up, I don't know. Perhaps, perhaps another lorry shed its load and he's got to pick it up or something. Anyway, that road, impassable, impassable. So what has old Angry done? Seize the day. Caveat emptor, carpe diem. I've decided to come another way, which actually is a quicker way. I prefer the country lanes, actually only because it takes me past the paper shop. So now what are the places going to do? No papers, no papers. That does annoy me. Talking of the papers, oh, firstly, I've got to apologise for the sound from yesterday. Okay, okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I didn't know the sound was going to be like that. I don't think that level of sound quality is acceptable and as you can see I'm back on the old system where the words that you can hear don't match the shapes of my mouth and I think that's just a that's a feature that's not a bug of this podcast you really, you just have to sort of listen to it and just look at me from time to time but not too hard that's probably not a bad idea anyway so uh, yeah I mean I know people don't, uh, the thing about podcasting and video casting, which I do know, is that the sound has to be good. And I don't just mean like, you know, it mustn't be bad. I mean that people can watch a video broadcast, even if the picture quality is really appalling, you know, I mean, well below broadcast quality, providing they can hear perfectly. And in most cases that is the case because the amount of bandwidth that's consumed by the audio is tiny compared to the amount of bandwidth that's consumed by the video. So these codecs, these code decoders that handle this magic that's happening between this screen and your screen, um, they know this and so what happens is that they, they downgrade the video and they don't but they don't downgrade the audio. So there's nothing worse than listening to some crackles and buzzes uh, and I knew straight away it wasn't right the I mean obviously I tried a different camera tried it didn't work not going to use it anymore and it is the camera I've used in previous uh, uh, video uh, for example the BDIA showcase the victory one where uh, which has had you know probably one of the highest views of any video I've ever done that was done on that camera but the trouble is, it was done. It was done in a very quiet environment. You know, it was done. <laughs> it was done in showcase. <laughs> Sorry, B. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so for, for sort of recording in a quiet environment, that's a very good camera, and it, and it was a very good camera. I mean, it still is, and I'll, I'll probably still use it again, but just not in a noisy environment. I think the reason why this one works better is because there's some post-processing. You know, that, because it's on a mobile phone. It's got a computer there which is able to sort of back up the um, sound recording with some post-processing CPU power to clean it up and, and filter it and recognise my voice. Which it should do really, because if you think about it, I mean, if I'm using Google and everything, then it's probably already got a record of what, uh, what uh, frequencies my voice is. And that's the other thing. If you get into these podcasts, you have to be an audio engineer. You have to be... You have to be good at sort of uh, video editing as well, um, but you, the audio side of it is the bit that most people don't really want to get into because it involves wave waveforms and amplitudes and frequencies and decibels and uh, uh, 
uh, switches, normalization, and uh, all sorts of <laughs> all sorts of weird shit. But it's great when you can do it. But it's like you know, it's like uh, I don't know Adobe Adobe Paint Paint Shop Pro. You flashing? Oh, oh no! It stopped recording. I've started the recording again. What? Oh, oh dear! You know what I need is a GoPro. Okay, that's what I need. A GoPro because it's got image stabilization. It's designed to be used in a like a sort of a rough and ready, rough and tumble environment. But I don't know what the audio is going to be like. I, I presume perhaps the audio might be brilliant. I don't know. But but you can't. These things cost 300 quid. You can't just sort of buy one and just see if the audio is any good. And then if you do, I suppose you can do, can't you? I suppose you can do, really. I mean, I not so much. I'm not sort of the person that does that sort of thing, but you can. Anyway, if um, these things become a thing, and I've done about 20 of them so far, so they might become a thing, then um, then I'll, perhaps I'll buy a decent camera. But um, what you need, you need one that's got image stabilization, and ideally I need one that's got a forward-facing screen so I can frame myself, because I'm saying the problem with a lot of the cameras is that you can't frame the shot from the front. So, uh, uh, yeah, anyway. So what's the topic for today? Well, I always take my cue from the news, for the news, from the news, from the Times. This morning is something about uh, the producers have said that they're not going to meet the government's target to cut sugar in their products by 25% um, by whenever the target is, probably 2020 or something. Always sounds good. I mean, I think the whole this whole sugar thing is just... A joke right so you know let's let's just start with the basics the government brings in a tax on sugar not because they want to put a tax on sugar but because they want to bring in a tax they're so short of money the government they are actually printing it and so, <laughs> but and so they've got to print it as fast as they can and if they can raise some through tax then that's great which is why uh, they put a tax on dying now they put the probate up from 200 quid to about seven thousand pounds uh, they put, uh, they brought in a budget that put, raised national insurance, which was a blatant breach of their election manifesto, promised not to raise national insurance. So, so these guys are desperate. So, uh, tax on sugar, why not? They, they tax, they tax oxygen. If they thought they could tax oxygen, they would tax oxygen. So, so the government brings in a tax on sugar because they need a, another tax. And idiots are calling for a tax on sugar saying uh, it would do something. So that's the second fallacy, that it's going to do anything. You cut the amount of sugar in food by 25%, people are going to buy 25% more sugar. They're just going to add sugar. Look at salt. They're, they're, they're saying, oh, you know, my mother, your mother, used to add salt to everything. She didn't put a pan on the hob without add in a pinch of salt to it, you saw her do it, I saw my mother do it, okay, everybody had sugar. We didn't have an obesity epidemic, we, we, for the most part, people I would say weren't that much less healthy because of the sugar. And sugar, we all know sugar's going to be one of those things, it's one of those things where, <coughs> where in 10 years time they're going to come out and they say, oh all that advice about sugar, uh, uh, all that advice about salt. That was all wrong. Sorry, sorry, got it all wrong. Decades of everybody trying to just do what we say. And yeah, by the way, it's not uh, five uh, fruits and vegetables a day. It's seven. Oh no, no, it's three. You know, it's like that Woody Allen film where they find out that saturated fat is actually good for you. And they can't make up their minds. Now they said that fat was bad for you. And now they're saying it's carbohydrates that's bad for you. I F the lot of them, that's what I say. Just eat what, as you can see, my philosophy is eat what the effing well you like. So, so, so cut sugar. And the industry, that's the third fallacy, that the industry had any intention at all of doing what they asked. The, the food industry and the government are like this. Right? Like this. The food industry and the government are like this. Just remember that they don't, you know, the the the, the idea that uh, 
the food industry is, is interested in producing healthy food and that the government is not, you know, uh, doesn't benefit indirectly or directly from the food industry and therefore is, is inter interested in feeding the population healthy food. I can understand the government's got some sort of slight incentive in trying to reduce the cost of the National Health Service, but they haven't actually squared this circle of how to pay for prevention yet. So really, it, it's just a general, you know, Treasury, can we save some money here type interest. It's not really a sort of, a, any, in any way, a serious interest. So, and dentists have been campaigning for less sugar for years, for years, including the idiots within the dental profession who say that the way to do it is to tax people. I mean, okay, look, give me a thousand people, right, with decay, that I could just talk to on a one-to-one -one basis and tell them what's causing the decay and how they can solve it, and then give someone else a thousand people to tax, and we'll see at the end of that 10 years who's got less decay, okay? Taxing sugar is not the way to solve decay. Education is the way to solve decay, particularly of the people who are suffering from the problem of eating more sugar than they think they do. Diet sheets are the way to solve decay, not taxing sugar. But that didn't matter, did it? Because in the end, the tax on sugar, was that brought in at the request of the dentists? Was that brought in because decay as a, as a disease is running out of control? No. Were, were dentists mentioned? No, not even mentioned. So it, the tax on sugar was brought in because of obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, dentistry was not even mentioned and here we are as a profession we've got we've got over a hundred years under our belt with a single enemy a single enemy sugar <laughs> sucrose refined carbohydrates and yet when they bring in a measure which is designed to reduce sugar consumption do they even tip their hat to the dental profession no they do not it's been it's brought in they didn't even mention it as an incidental side effect they didn't even mention it as a as a as a welcome benefit <laughs> no 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 it's all it's not because people have got no teeth it's because they're getting too fat they're getting too fat with no teeth but never mind the no teeth bit just the fat bit is <laughs> so there we are we've got a disingenuous government with a with a hello Therefore, and, uh, and an industry that's uh, no less disingenuous and doing things for the wrong reasons and, and would, you know, I mean, the food industry, they were trying to clone meat the other day, like a couple of years ago, and that went down well. They, I mean, I don't have a massive problem with them genetically engineering stuff, to be honest, because I know that causes a load of trouble and people are very strongly object to that, but the... The, the thing about genetically engineering is that, I mean, if you cross two dogs or two cattle or two sheep, then that's what you're doing. You are genetically engineering them. I mean, all they're doing is just speeding this process up. Um, I don't know of genetic modification. I don't know, you know, whether it's good to uh, allow people to have uh, patents on uh, DNA sequences and make seeds that don't reproduce so that the farmers have to buy them every year. Personally, I don't think that's that's brilliant, you know. But then, if they want to make um, crops that are resistant to uh, weed killers, so that they can use weed killers to, or less harmful weed killers to keep the weeds under control, you know, then then what's that? Is that is that good or bad? I mean, I'm sort of saying it's it's good, it seems to me, on balance. But then, what they what do they do? They then make these seeds so that they can't reproduce, so you have to buy them again next year. So that's bad. I mean, we're talking about the people who, <clears throat> if you're old enough to remember, put um, put antifreeze in wine. The French, they actually put ethylene glycol in uh, in French wine because uh, they said it made it taste better, and it probably did. I don't know, but the point was that uh, it's like um, <clears throat> it's like the fluoride debate, isn't it? Why adulterate the water? Why why put anything in it? And it doesn't matter how much of an argument you can make for how good it is. There's thousands of arguments for good things that could be put in the water supply or in the bread or whatever. 
and they said yeah yeah it's a good you know it's a good idea to put it in the wine but people said no no wine is grapes that's what we want wine grapes and sugar sugar and grapes wine no antifreeze thank you very much and so they had to take the ethylene glycol out and then uh, <clears throat> in China they put uh, melamine in baby powder powdered plastic melamine yeah, the stuff that the, the stuff that your mother's worktop was made of, you know, the really, really almost indestructible plastic work surface that uh, that uh, you could chop on. You know, you didn't need a chopping board, but you did because it got chopped up anyway. But but the point is that some bright spark realised that baby milk was being tested for its protein content, and that he could fool the protein test by by putting powdered plastic melamine in the baby milk. Which, which went brilliantly, <clears throat> had the one tiny, tiny side effect that all this plastic melamine gummed up these newborn babies' kidneys or whatever, and they all died. And uh, when uh, they found out that it was going on, it was a big scandal, obviously. A lot of children very, very sick and died as a result. And the Chinese, who don't muck about, just rounded up everyone who was responsible and killed a lot. <laughs> How do you like them apples? <laughs> so, you know, I, I'm sort of quite growing. This Chinese approach to regulation of the food industry is sort of growing on me a bit. <laughs> so, don't tell me that the food industry is, is, is working for the benefit of feeding humans. They're not. They are, they are working for themselves. They are uh, economic actors acting in their own rational self-interest and same as the rest of us. And that doesn't involve uh, not poisoning a few people from time to time in their cause. Oh dear. So uh, yeah, I mean, what are, they, what are they trying to sell? I mean, they don't want to sell. They want to charge a lot of money for protein. Protein's quite difficult, you know, protein is cattle, cattle. Use, use up a fortune in water. Water's very scarce. They require land, grazing, a lot of maintenance. Um, plants, not so much. Plant protein, most people are not happy with plant protein, are they? Who likes a, who likes a tofu burger? Um, what have they got plenty of? Well, they've got plenty of fat. Fat, very high in calories and produced as a byproduct. When you're making your frozen burgers to sell in Iceland, you, you, you can get fat as a byproduct. So what you want to do is sell that fat, you know, stick it on uh, and carbohydrates, stick some fat and some carbohydrates together and tell everybody that they need to have a bag of crisps in their lunchbox. Um, fat, and, uh, fat and carbohydrate are cheap and plentiful and they can make a big profit on the massive profit on selling fat. Um, they can't make a massive profit on selling protein because protein is expensive to produce in the first place. So anyway, the sugar industry is not going to achieve its target of cutting sugar out of foods. Never intended to in the first place, and I'm pretty sure that when they agreed to meet the target, they um, they uh, they knew from the start off. It's a bit like the Americans with the old climate change, isn't it? They knew, they knew, everybody knew, <laughs> we all knew from the start off. There's absolutely no chance at all that they were going to meet their climate change objectives. That's why they don't even think they even signed up to them. They sort of supported them in spirit, and now, and now Trump's come along and, and said, "Look, guys, you know, let's not even pretend we're going to do this. We're just not going to do this." And, and in order to sort of make ourselves seem more reasonable, we're going to double up and say that climate change doesn't exist. So, so what are you screaming about, you know? But the food industry never intended to uh, to reduce the amount of sugar and stuff because it's cheap. It's extremely cheap. And it's, it gives a lot of food calories, and calories, you know, fills people up. There's a lot of satisfaction in sugar, sweet. There's all sorts of reasons why people eat sugar. And taxing them more is not going to stop them doing it. Okay? All right, I'm at work now. Hope the new camera's better. I'm, I'm sorry about it. If there's sync problems, I'm sorry about that. I'll, I'll think about saving up for a new camera. All right. See you tomorrow. Bye.